Hey everybody, it is Lewis Porter Jr. It is Wednesday, uh, July 20th. I'm here for a lovely, no another lovely edition of Transparency Agenda. Uh, it's my favorite day. It's Wednesday. Um, actually, technically, this is really my favorite day of the year, because it's not just Wednesday. It's the Wednesday before uh, San Diego Comic Con, which uh, drives me crazy. So, I mean, it's just, oh, it's just an awesome, awesome Wednesday. I mean, you know, Comic-Con is the dream for me, at least. I know I've always wanted to go, you know, it's, I'll tell you a story when we get into this. I'll tell you a story about how I missed going, my, I had an opportunity to go and I missed it. It's kind of crazy. Well, not really crazy, but it's part of my life as I describe it. So, that's going on. Um, of course, today was comic book day, so I got some comic books to show. Um, last night... Uh, I showed you guys, actually pull it back here, I showed a lot of you guys look, uh, I forgot to put the note of it actually in the show notes, which really upset me, from last night. So I wanted to show it again, if you didn't see it last night, if you're seeing it for the first time, um, this book, it's a great book, you need to pick it up. I'm going to put it in the show notes tonight, so that I won't forget, because last night was, uh, I forgot, I just forgot. Oh look, Yashika Florence is watching, hi Yashika! See, yeah, she she goes a good friend of mine. She's she's like you know, she's all awesome eyes by what I'm doing here. It's pretty amazing to her. That's why I get to make fun of her on my own show. That's great. Mm. Ah, yes. Yeah, so there you go. Um, what are the fun things that are happening? Um, it's been kind of a quiet day in the RPG scene. I really haven't seen anything that was so incredibly, you know, up or amazing. Um, RPG. Um, well, Paizo has been... Oh, they're talking about third-party stuff. Let's talk about um, Gen Con. Everybody's talking about Gen Con, Gen Con, Gen Con, Gen Con. I'm not talking about Gen Con because I'm not going to Gen Con, so I'm not talking about Gen Con. Um, Playground Adventures, I guess, released a new product here. Um, that's there. It's For the Hive by uh, Jay Gray. I don't know Jay Gray, but it's the main piece they're talking about. Um, Dire Rug Rat Publishing continues with their Tavern Tales series. Uh, who else is coming? Uh, Legendary Games, Beginner Adventures, The Trails, of, The Trials of the Apprentice, uh, Their Adventure, The Wizard's Dungeon. Who else? Uh, who's it from? It didn't tell me who's from. Uh, Naughty Works. Naughty Works released two products. Drop Dead also released a product. Um, Raging Swan um, released also released a product. And of course, there's all kinds of goodness for you, Pathfinder Files. Oh, see, Yashika said hello. Isn't that nice, Yashika? Isn't that nice? Oh. That's so nice. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be, you know, it's kind of a light week. I, I'm guessing a lot of people are still ramping up for um, for Gen Con. As usual, I'm not going to Gen Con, so we're not going to discuss any more about that. That just upsets me. So blah, blah, Gen Con, going to be awesome. Yes, you'll be having tons of fun. I will be here just sweating it out in the big heat, as it were. So uh, let me get started with the fun stuff. Okay, today's, you know, being Wednesday, comic, one, comic book Wednesday, I only got three books today. Uh, I got Green Lantern, uh, Justice League, you know, and of course, the book that I've really been enjoying, uh, Squadron Supreme. Uh, I've been enjoying Squadron Supreme a lot. Uh, James Robinson has been writing this. James Robinson is one of my favorite um, Golden Age, I think I revisionist guys. Um, he wrote the book, uh, The Golden Age, if you've ever seen it from DC, it's one of my favorites. And this, uh, Squadron Supreme's been really kind of interesting, I've been liking a lot, like, I, I really, really just like it, I think it's just, they've done a lot of smart things on this, so, it's one of those things that I, I suggest you either read it and read it and trade, so it's also better. Um, this is the image for next issue, let's see if I can get this right, and, uh, Thundra, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite Marvel characters, for making an appearance, and Squadron Supreme is one of my favorite Marvel creations from DC. You know, I've always thought it was amazing, so that's why. Um, Justice League, another, you know, first issue, but another solid, well done, well put together book. Uh, what's the picture of Wonder Woman, I like to say? I mean, this is a cool picture. I thought this was a cool picture. You know, boom. Wonder Woman Lightning Bolt, it's kind of cool. Something you can think about for your artwork, I'm just saying. And then, of course, the big spread, which would probably not look as well. So, boom. See that that's a picture. That's that's a half page picture. That should belong somewhere in a book somewhere. But it's awesome. We'll place the tanks with horses and things like that and like like that. You got a cool piece with a magic see? 
That's what I tell you. Comic books, people. Comic books. They got all the good. They got all the good stuff in there. Comic books. Um, while on the other hand, uh, this Green Land was not really impressive, and this artwork is not. Well, let me phrase that. There's several people working on this book. This book has gotten so many people working on it to the point where I'm like, are you kidding me? It's it's it's, it's a lot of people working on this book. I like a lot of people. Like on the front cover. I mean, look at all these names. Look at all these names. I can tell you right back. Hi-Fi is a colorist, all right? And I'm guessing all the rest of these are like, like Sam Humphreys, I believe. It's, if it's Sam Humphreys. You know, he's he's an artist. And these are artists. And, and this is one book. You know, this is one book. You know, it probably, it feels like it's like 40 pages, you know, book. But this is one book. And I'm like, the, the art in the middle doesn't get, it gets, it's just not a, it's, I did not get excited. So I was not very excited by that. Um, yeah, it's kind of upsetting. So it just upset me. It was just upset me. I'm just going to call it like that. I'm not going to look more into it. I think you get all upset. You'd be like, oh, it wasn't this. It just wasn't what I thought it was going to be. That's the best way to look at it. Um, so uh, what was this? This week it was this week. I was I got this really. There it is. Boom. Jim Zubovich. Uh, Jim Zub, you might have heard. The person who wrote uh, the Pathfinder. Uh, comic books has a website that I'm a big fan of and it's also a lot of t- tons of information for creators you might want to check out. It is literally www.jimzub.com and in it he has, you know, it's, basically, it's it's his information about just talking about the industry and comics but a lot of this relates directly to digital sales because uh, Jim has been, I guess, doing digital and doing creator own stuff for a very long time. If you look on the right side of his web page, if you're going to it, you can go to it now, you'll see a list of tutorials. While some of these won't directly relate to role playing, some of these actually will, and some of these are actually quite interesting. And the one most recently he put out on the sixteenth <coughs> was Creator Creator Own Economics Grabbing the Long Tail. It's a great article. It's incredibly informative. If you don't understand um, how single individual comic book sales work and what that really means, mm-hmm. you're like, what do you mean? It's just the selling individual ones. No, it's it, this is a very, very detailed, in-depth look at sales like that. And it's, and it's incredibly, incredibly interesting. I am, I'm a huge, huge fan of this. And he just goes into a lot of the, and he's talking about his Wayward book, which is put out by Image, mm. which has kind of been described by like, uh, what was it? It was a Buffy in Japan was a phrase. I can get the exact phrase. So, if that's what I feel it was, and it felt like that way to me. So, I guess, well, Buffy would be helpful too. Yeah, Buffy in Japan, and you know, it's it's taken off very well in the print. The weird part is, which is you know part of this, he says you at the beginning, you know, the steady growth and it's equal. Then all of a sudden, in like um, at the beginning of 2015, QE Q2. It just the, the 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 print just shoots up. I'm a, and the way he talks about it, he's talking about through um, traditional sales outlets, which is stores and things like that. Which it looks like that people were buying individual copies. Because he talks about this too. He talks about how people were buying individual copies. The first issue did very very well. It doesn't give you any actual numbers, but you can see by the graph. The first one did very well. Number two is about half of that, and number three is about like fifteen percent off that. And you see the slow, slow progression sliding down. But also with it, you can also see the digital sales on top of it. So you still see print is a big piece of it. And digital starts taking, you know, sliding, sliding, sliding as it normally would. But the weird part is that, it, it, you know, it's, it's a, he goes like, here's a great example. A sales drop of 21% between ARC 2 and ARC 3 dropped our initial profitability by 67.7%. Think about that. He went from one book to another book and had a massive drop in profitability. And we all know about what I said about about the whole margin. You know, so that's king. So what makes it kind of interesting is like the sales on the books start up high and they slide down. Looks like it's sliding down, sliding down. But the weird thing that happens, which is kind of interesting, they talk about the trade trade paperback sales. The initial, the initial trade paperback sales for the first paperback and the second one, the pre-orders, the initial orders are basically the same. I mean, they're basically the same. They're about, you know, equal. The third one's a little bit less, maybe like uh, 20% less. And the deluxe, which I guess hasn't come out yet, is like 
let's say half of what the third sweeper back. So, the, and like I said, these are random things. We're not giving real numbers because we don't have real numbers. We're just giving you information. But the lifetime sales on it, I mean, one, two, three, four. The lifetime sales are four times what the initial sales were for the first trade back. The first trade back. And the second one has twice the lifetime sales as the initial order. So it tells me that people are interested. So what it seems like to me is happening, and I think he even agreed with it, people are reading like one or two books, they're liking what they read, and they're buying the trade. Or they're, you know, like me, go to the library. If the library does comic books, it's great. They've got great trades you can read there. Read the trade, get interesting, and then buy it later. And I think that's kind of the thing. And we talked about, and I mentioned to him saying, you know, with with these numbers going like this, and like I told you, the previous one, where you could see that the print just took off, which looks like it's related directly to the trades, and not the actual comic book sales. It seems that people are looking at comic books in trade form as the more important, more realistic way to do comic books. You still have to re- produce comic books, but people want the collected pieces all together. They want, they're, apparently they're looking to spend the money. And that's kind of, and that's kind of the, the long tail aspect to it. And, you know, is that, you know, digital, which is another part that I'm a big fan of, is very important with the sense that you don't pay a lot of money for the production. Well, most times you'd pay, you know, a lot of money to put it printed. You don't have that with digital. Digital just goes, boom, you make the product, it goes straight out, you save money that you don't have to worry about printing. So I think this is kind of very, very important. It's a great article to read. I'd suggest people read it, really get into it. I mean, like I said, he talks about this constantly, so it's something that if you're really serious and want to learn more about just the business side, he talks very much about it. Like he has the traditional, you know, how to break into comics, how to find artists. That's important. If you're looking for artists and you don't know anything about it, it's a good article. You should read it. You know, I've read it. I mean, I, I know how to find artists, but it's a good article. There's some good information. And like writing for comics, pitching, uh, conventions. If you've never been to a convention, he gives you what you need to get ready for a convention and the experience itself. There's like two stories about that. Creator own economics. Retail sales, digital sales, sales trends one, two, and three, sales bump, uh, 2010 versus 2015. Creator owned economics from 2015 and now July 16. Web and print working together. Uh, communication, organization, tone, time saving tips, networking, promotion, key retailers, your press kit, building retailer trust. That is actually a very interesting one. A lot of people should actually read that just from. And here's like one that makes me, or it's two really that I really like. And the title is just really kind of to say it all. Number one, jealousy is creative poison. Oof. Think about that for a second. Jealousy is creative poison. That's that's deep. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't want to talk about jealousy, but that happens in this industry. People get jealous. You know, people get jealous. They don't want to say anything because there are egos involved. But you know, there's some jealousy. Let's not kid anybody. And then the next one, productivity and writer's block. Boom. Those are two things you, people should be reading. I mean, when you watch this video, get off. Go read that. It's worth every cent. Uh, Jim's up. Not gonna add it to you once again. I gotta add him to my list of things I'm talking about tonight. Oh my goodness, that's all I do. I just, you know, I do these transparency agenda shows, and I'm just adding. I'm just giving you guys all this information, and I'm not gonna lie. I am. You look. I am hoping. The reason I do this show, and a lot of people were like, "Well, why do you keep doing the show? You don't have to do the show." I am. I am 100% hoping that the information I keep giving out. And I'm giving you the best information I can, update as possible. Things change, things change, and I let you know. But I'm hoping that I keep giving, 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 giving. That eventually, that will return in people buying product or inviting me to go to cons or, or working on stuff together. That's where I'm doing it. You know, I'm doing this to get my face out there so people know that I'm serious about this as a business. And I want this to be successful for a lot of people. And I want us to, you know, work hard at this. Because I think this is a great business. I think it's a great field. I think people love doing it. And even better, there's tons of money to be made in this. Don't believe there's not any money. That's garbage. Hasbro has made millions and billions of dollars. Not just role playing, but I'm talking games. Video games, printing, IP, it all branches out from there. So, and since it's Comic Book Wednesday... Let's talk about let's talk about how comic books let's talk about how comic books affect tabletop. We'll talk t- tabletop because this is kind of an easy one to go to. So uh, a while back, I can't even remember how long it's been. I started talking about intellectual property on just what you should be do- things you should be doing about IP. And one of the big things that I thought was a smart smart thing to do 
was to develop Iconics. And I saw that Paizo had done that. And I didn't really understand initially what was the big deal. And then I really looked at it from a, from a business perspective. When they're building their Iconics, you're really not just building Iconics. What you're building is intellectual property that you can fold into other places. Prime example. You've got um, many of the many characters of Iconics have wound up in comic books for, for Pathfinder. Now, they all have their own stories in the books and people have some ideas about them. And th But the comic books give you that kind of action moment to get them, take them home, read them. And books do the same thing. But we're just talking about comics right now because we're talking about pretty pictures. They'll come in also in a second. You'll see. So, developing, you know... A fan base like that is kind of a great way to do it. You can probably, you can basically do it as two things at once. Fans of the RPG, if they like the book, they'll pick it up and it'll be a cool thing. Fans of comics, if they like it, will pick it up and maybe find about the game. So it's just this big circle that goes around. You're trying to basically feed each other. Usually the problem that happens the most, and I think people, everyone accepted it, it's true. People will develop comic books based on specific IP and there's no way for people just to jump in and start reading it. Because it's like, I don't want to do restrictive, but it is kind of restrictive. If you're a fan of Ravenloft, you're going to pick up a Ravenloft comic book. That's pretty simple. But how do you get someone who's never heard of Ravenloft to pick it up? What about Ravenloft would make them interested enough to pick it up and check it out? You know, what, what is it? What will that be? And I think that becomes an issue that needs to be looked at and really examined. So, you know, I think Paizo has affected that in a couple ways. They've kind of rigged the system, but in the best way possible. So, you buy their Pathfinder comic book. Usually the back piece has something RPG related. And I think that's kind of like the first smart step. Uh, you need to have something in there that people who, who give them a reason to buy it. Spill my water. you got to give them some reason. Because if we're going to buy the comic book, and let's be honest, the comic book... Four bucks. It's got to be. I paid two fifty for this comic book. Two fifty. And this comic book, I think this is forty pages now. I think these are these are now forty pages. One, two, three, four, five, uh oh, six, seven, eight, nine. Ooh. It's 36. They're out there. Yeah, 36. The no comic book, if you did not know, the standard comic book is 32 pages. So they've expanded pages. They've also added a big ad in the middle, too. Don't kid you. There's a Snickers ad that covers three pages. Four pages of Snickers ad. So, you know, it ain't really... You're getting four more stories, but hey. A big name writer or artist... This is from Ben McFarlane. A big writer or artist will pull the outside out and some... Yes, that is true. A big name... If you put Warren Ellis to write for Ravenloft... Or Jim Lee to do the artwork, you're going to get some fans. You are going to automatically get people who want to just check up with their names attached to it. But to get them to stay, that's a different story. Because, I mean, everybody can, we can all do the bait and switch. I mean, that happens all the time in comics. So and so is writing a book. Yay! They stay on four or five issues and they have to leave. Oh. And it's just, and that's kind of the, I don't want to call it bait and switch, but it's bait and switch. Because, I mean, Warren Ellis just did a, a, just did a series. Uh, good Lord, what's in my pocket all the time? Uh, did a series for or Marvel called Moon Knight. And it lasted so short. He was supposed to be on it was going to be a continuing series. It seemed really cool. And it was a kind of cool pitch. And the idea was crazy. And I was like, what is this? This could be really interesting. And then by issue six, he was gone. And I was like, oh, God. So it's kind of upset me that they spend all this money piping this thing up. And then he bails. And then he did another series, um, Karnak. This was supposed to be another great idea. Really innovative. And that book was just late. I mean, the first issue came out. And then, like, six weeks later, the second issue came out. And then, like, four months later, the third issue came out. It's like, uh, you know, I just said, forget it. I'm not going to read it. I did, you know, I lost interest in it. And that is a problem that happens constantly in the, uh, I'd guess, say, the, the universe of, of comic-related stuff. It just, issues pop up. And they have, they have similar but weirder issues than in RPGs. I think RPGs can have... Smaller, more focused things, and kind of our fan base is kind of built on waiting for good stuff to come out because you know it's a game. You're gonna be playing this game forever, and you know there's that aspect. 
But back to the whole comic book thing. All right. The other part I believe that comic books work really well is that it develops artwork for you. Anything you put in a comic book, you can put that in your game. Why would you not? You know, why would you not do it? It's beautiful artwork. If the artwork's awesome and it's talking about your setting or whatever, and people seem to like it, boom, put it in your books. You know, you can put it with word bubbles, without whatever, but put it in your book. It's you saves you money. Remember, we're trying to save money, and you want to express your art everywhere. You get to see it. So that's that's a that's a thing. I also believe that I think people need to take a lot. Like I said, take a different step with comics and how they're created. And you know, I think that more three D elements should be added to it. I think the backgrounds should be done three D. You know, there's there's no need to do draw out backgrounds. You should basically have some stock. 3D camera angle set, and you just boom shoot in this location, boom shoot in this. But let's be honest, certain things are going to be done over and over. A tavern scene is going to be done over and over. Um, visually, the closest thing I can think of that would kind of be the mix match that well, besides the Red Star, do I have the book up there? The book up. Let's see, no, that's uh oh, there it is. Boom. See, another book i got to write and put on this list of stuff. The Red Star. Um, if you find a copy, uh, there's several trades. Oh, I say several, but probably like five trades. I bought this a while ago. Um, this is $34. It's a great book to pick up. Let me see. Visually, it's... it's. I'm trying not to crack it open too much, because I want to show you some stuff that's really kind of cool. Visually, actually, let me show you the picture. Chris Gossett did a lot of the artwork in this. And very, very beautiful artwork. That's a, lots of cool coloring. But stuff like this. See? That's 3D. That's 2D. See, if I had my issues out, I would show you this. The, the scene that I described that sold it all for me was a simple... a very simple scene. A girl, a girl firing a gun. Actually, these are... Um... Yeah, this one's this is partially 3D. See the helicopters here. I know it's hard to see. Here are 3D. God, see next uh, next time I'm going to find the comic book. It's in my pile somewhere. That shows you some great tricks they did with 3D. That just I, and remember this book. This book is nearly a decade old. This isn't a, a new occurrence. This is this is a tough one, but maybe we'll see it. Like the background here, you got the you got the plane in the middle, but the background is all 3D. See, that's not really a great one. It's hard to see this one. <laughs> I wish I could find a great one that you guys could look at and be like, oh, okay, I, I totally get it. But once again, oh, boom. The vehicle, 3D, background drawn, and you know, there's tons of little stuff like that. God, like I said, I wish I could show you the one piece that I think would sell everybody on what I'm talking about. Oh, here's, a, here's, an, uh, here's another one. The palace room. The star in the background is all 3D. Uh, the red star, Swords of Lies. Uh, Swords of Lies. I'm going to put this in the show notes, of course. I'm going to do that right now. So, you know, I think there's a way to mix and match, and that kind of stuff becomes art for your own projects. I think that we are at a point where the technology and our dreams kind of are uh, close to being perfect. You know, that's what I think. That's just my my, my feeling. And I think a lot of us don't think about doing um, something as simple as a comic for ourselves. There, we have a comic for New Exodus. I've been writing it for years. It's called Grand Theft Exodus. I've attempted to try it several times due to several false starts. But, you know, I but I know I know that the first probably the first issue if the first, you know, 30, 30 some odd pages is going to be. You know, I know what kind of beats. Those are they're scripted in my head. We probably have about 13 of actually hard pages scripted. Hmm. What also made it different is when I when I actually designed it, let's give you a comic book. So a typical comic book is made up of panels, and the panels can be any direction. See this one has four panels, boom, 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 you know, and ugh, let me add, this one has three panels, so 
and this one has four panels, four panels, four panels. What drove me crazy about comic books is that, like, um, I'll go ahead and pull it out of the bookshelf. If I can find it really quick, I'm trying to look. So, comic books kind of did multi different panel layouts. Oh, if I could find it really quick, I just want to get up and get it. Uh, I don't want to get on my chair and look for it. So, I'm looking for. Ah, crap. So, da, 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 da. I can find it quickly. Now, not the little frequency. Why did all my books out of order? No, that's still one. <laughs> Jesus. Ah, no. Is it? No. Ah, oh, crap. Yes! Yes! Ta da! I knew I'd find it. <laughs> I knew I'd find it. So, was this the wrong one? This is the wrong one! Damn it! I need you. Alright. Ah. So, uh, relax. We'll go to Relentless first. So, this is the first trip back of Authority, um, written by Warren Ellis. You'll notice a the theme. Warren Ellis is in a lot of the books that I'm doing stuff for. Uh, drawn by um, Brian Hitch. When Brian Hitch first joined comics, he had very much a style very similar to Alan Davis. If you don't know who Alan Davis is, you must go out and pick out some of his work. Alan Davis is a well-known, well-respected artist. Um... What Brian Hitch became kind of, I describe it as famous for, he started doing what they uh, do a lot of cinematic action. Very long, wide panels. Let me see if I can get a good fighting scene so you can really see where his strong points come in. Okay, this is kind of a good page. You see, these big wide pages like this, this is his kind of signature thing. And I, and I think as a smart artist, the smart producer of products, you should think about doing like this. Okay, these two images, this one and this one, if you if you've ever seen the Authority RPG, and there's an Authority RPG, you can find those images in those. Okay. See this page over here, where this finger is? See, everything's like widescreen. Yeah, there's simple shots here, but there's, everything's like widescreen. So you get these widescreen looking and that's what they called them back then widescreen but he drew like this and it made it look like a movie i i never ever believed it was it was something he just thought of i believed he went out of his way to manipulate the artwork to show that we're not making comic books these are not comic books these are not comic books people are like what do you mean this is it? these are not comic books these are that's a good picture these are scripts for movies and we've got you told you what the script looks like and on top of that here's a beautiful piece there's a very bright next piece was that for phantoms one of my favorite jets that's why i know it very well uh m6 this is a f15 a 15 uh, eagles yeah if it looks like a 15 eagle yeah even though it's technically over london and they have you're using u.s planes but i'll let that go well this is actually over la so no those planes are actually right. This shot is from L.A. I forgot. Um, so, yeah. So, it's it just... They... They made a comic book whose main purpose was to sell for movies. And See what happens here? In my show notes. So... Oh, now I got a weak link on my computer now to drive me crazy. Oh, thank you. That's better. So, those things I think tie together with the creativity of doing RPGs. That's just, that's something we've got to think about. We've got to move in the direction of, let's think of different ways to use the IP beyond just the game. Because look, I built Neo Exodus as a campaign setting for a world. But I always had a story I was going to tell about a little girl who's a thief and her, uh, her Kavian, a.k.a. Ratman mentor sidekick, and them traveling around this lovely world of Exodus and doing crimes. That was the idea I had. That, I built the world, but they were in the world to, to just for that. That's why I built that world, for them to play in. And now I built rules for that world. I built a whole setting. People know how things are supposed to act. And now with that, 
I can go back and say, okay, I got a lot of fans who picked up the RPG. They liked it. They gave me money for a Kickstarter. There's some very much interest. So now those same people could be my my start for my niche. Give away, I gotta. I still have to find a way to do this. I still don't know. I'm gonna find a way to give away Grand Theft Access for free online, and then find a way. I have a plan, of course, to back end it to do it to publishing, where we basically will say, okay, instead of doing you know comic books, because I think comic books the floppies like these are gonna die out, but it's just too much of a cost. You do trade paperbacks where you do the entire series or whatever, whatever section you do, plus you put in there the scripts that you wrote from, so people can actually see the scripts like, hey. I'm getting the book, and I'm getting actual scripts, and then we'll actually even put artwork from the artist doing stuff. That is my ultimate plan that I see for Grand Theft Exodus. And yes, it is a long-term project. And yes, it is going to be very expensive, because we're giving away a little of the information for free. So, uh, trade paper... This is from Jacob, who I've been missing. Trade paperbacks collections of webcomics always sell well. I think they sell well because you've already got fans who've seen the stuff that are interested... And now it's like, hey, did you like the stuff we did there? Here's some more stuff we have. There's some behind-the-scenes stuff that you didn't know about. Um, I've always... Oh, see, I missed it. Jacob would like to, Jacob would like to draw Grand Theft Exodus, you know. And, but, you know, he's just too busy. Everybody, everybody's busy. It's a busy time, man. It's a busy time. And doing a, you know, doing a comic book is expensive. So you got to pay for all that stuff. you got to think ahead. And, it's, oh, it's just, and like I said, I, I've got a look that I've already defined on what I want it to be. And... It's a million little things, but this kind of intellectual property can, can basically span out and, and push it in different directions for you as a publisher, or you creating content. It's just something that I think people will be interested in, but you kind of have to get them excited. All right, Ben said, but comics are using the same formula used for RPGs, selling components at lower cost and collecting the trade. True, but the difference between... Did everyone hear that? Let me just say it again. I think I mumbled that through. But comics are using the same formula you used for RPGs. Selling the components at lower cost and then collecting them for trades. True, but here's the biggest here's the biggest difference between comics and RPGs. Comic book fans are used to coming every month to re-up to look for the thing. They've built in their, in their, in their psyche of every month that I go to the store, this new issue of, well, whatever. It's, yeah, I can't remember this book. These two books, there'll be another issue after this one. And another issue after this one. RPGs don't do that. RPGs make books and we chop them in pieces and we fake that effect. But really we don't we don't even have like it's not like it's not like next month we're gonna have a book that continues from the last book we did. And next month we don't do that. We tell kind of individual stories sectioned off of the bigger world. And like here's the big world, here's a big campaign book. And we can get that in pieces, but still it's all gonna be one thing eventually. This is all connected. And then we start talking about little pieces in those books and, and give them little pieces. Like, here's one for you. You may like this, you may not. You've got to find some way to get people to pick us up so regularly that it's just income coming in that we can't beat. All right. Now, see, I'm upset. I did that because now I've got to talk about Indigo Donkey. Add that down to the list. Ugh. So, Indigo Donkey, we're kind of developing that kind of system kind of a repeat system that people come at a certain time, get the project, and then give us more stuff. Um, okay, Ben has actually made a very good point. On here he goes, that depends what I was talking about. Look at which is PAX Global Frequency. Yes, they were built to be short series. And that's kind of, you know, that's kind of, those are kind of unique things. I'm thinking long form. I should have been more specific. But long form comic books, you know, it's month after month after month after month, and that's how they hook you. Short form, while as interesting as they are, you kind of know up, up, up front what your commitment is going to be. You know, that's that's kind of the important part. You know, you know it's going to be X amount of time. You know it's going to be this this or that, and that ties into you know the the I guess the agreement that we've come to. You know, you know I I go to I get my Marvel previews. All right, I go to the previews. Oh look. Power and Iron Fist number 10. I know number 9 came out the month before. Number 10 is now coming out. You know, Iron Fist number... Iron Fist, plural, number 1 is coming out. You know, it's like... And for them, their plan to fix the problem of comic books and people not getting interested in more than issue number 1 is they keep doing issues number 1. And that's a dumb idea, but I'm not getting into that. That's another... That's a long talk for that. But when you're getting into... is following the creator's content versus the IP. But are you... Okay, this is this is a very oh, see. I want to make this a short 
freaking video, but I guess it's going to get longer. Ben and I are talking the fun stuff. I think there's a there's a mixture of both, Ben. I think people are following the content creators and the IP. Because there are some creators who make great, great stuff. Warren Ellis is known to be a content creator. But Spider-Man, and I'm going to say, you know, John Romita Jr. or John Romita, John Romita Sr. Is, a, is iconic to that character. People followed Spider-Man because John Romita Jr. was on it. But when John Romita Jr. left, they still read Spider-Man because the content was still high quality. I think you can... Uh, Flash. Flash is another one. Flash had Mark Wade write that book for a long time. People followed it because Wade was on it. When Wade got off the book, Jeff Johns got on the book. Not many people knew about Jeff Johns, but Jeff Johns focused on the character, and he'd done a couple things, but nothing really major, nothing as big, nothing big like he did now. People followed the Flash, but they liked the Flash. I was one of those guys who liked the Flash. I liked Mark Wade also, so it's kind of a win-win. When the new guy came on, I was like, "Oh, great, this new guy. I got to wait for another good guy to come back to the Flash." See, or maybe let's see what he maybe we'll do something good, and he did. He did something really, really good. Mark. Wade, see how this becomes a long, tedious process. Jeff, John. Uh, sure, Warren Ellis, Brian Wood, Ellen Moore, Rick Redeem. Rick Remander is not impressive. I don't care what anybody says. I think that guy is not that good. I read Moon Knight because Wood wrote it for the first arc. I wrote Secret Avengers because Ellis wrote it. I read. I read. Um. Well. I read Avengers when Kurt Busiek was jumping on the book, but I'm an Avengers fan. I read Avengers because I like the team. I don't care who gets on the team. I'm going to see their interpretation, but I love the Avengers. That's why I read the Avengers. That's why I've been reading the Avengers from... Jeez, I've been reading the Avengers, I can say, off the bookshelf from, like, issue, like, 220-something. But, you know, I've been reading, you know, collecting. I've, I've At one point, I almost had a... God, I almost had to run from issue, like... 90s-ish. It was, it was a Crease Pro War. I right, the first one. Up. I was, I was an Avengers fan. I'm an Avengers fan first and foremost. The writers are pretty good. And yes, that is true. That is, and the other part to this one, having Wood on Conan, that was a double win, yes it was, but that's why you're favoring the long form. But it's true. I believe the long form has, the, the long form is about the characters, the short form is about the writers and artists. So, you know, but don't, but, and I understand, some people don't want to write a book for 50 years. That's why you don't see teams last on books for, you know, more than six, seven months, which is still good. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's tons of stuff I've read that's awesome. But I want the agreement before that I'm going to get a short book. I'm going to get a short run. Um, something I thought about, if a lot of people don't know, well, I guess people do know, I've always been planning to do a comic book company in my head. And it's, so far, the name I've been running is Amazing Comics. You can run with that for a long day. That's just my personal choice. So, with Amazing, the whole plan would be is that we would do long-form comic books, but in short-form setup. And this is something that Marvel should just do. I think this is just what they're doing is silly. Every every six-month period, and this year is going to be six or four months. It all depends, but most piece can be an even amount. Those can be set up for a collection. So it's going to be like you know, for example. The Avengers, the Korvac Saga. Well, the Korvac Saga is going to run six issues. Boom. At the end, we're going to collect it. It's going to be the Avengers and the Trial of Ultron. That'll be the next six issues. Boom. So you basically break it up into trades. You've already broken up the trades and you deliver them in six issues. So you always have a number one. You always have like a last issue of this set. You know, marketing tricks. So you always think that people are going, oh, we got another number one. Oh, we got another number one. Oh, we got another number one. Because people get so upset, I mean, like me, they keep re-upping the series. It's like, we'll get 13, 14, 15 inches. Oh, the sales will drop down. Okay, number one coming out. It's like, oh, okay, number one coming out. Because they know number one sell. So, to me, it's like, just drop it to number one. And just, you know, make it like, it. make it's going to be a trade. You know, part one, you know, Avengers, the Korvac Saga, part one. That's issue number one. And then it goes all the way to issue number six with the finale. Trade everybody back. Boom. Next one. And just do that. Either set it for four issues or six issues. Make either one. You know, depending who you are, that you, you go with that. That way, you develop... And then this is the best part. You tie the stories into stuff that happened before. So if something happened in this one, you can refer back to it. So it is still long form, but in short bites that people can swallow. Because collectors want number one. Regular folks, 
Yeah, you know, well, once, but once again, we all know, let's see, this has been responding, because collectors want number ones, but regular folks think you can get back to the series at number one. Yeah, I mean, oh God. It's also tough. I mean, let's be honest. People who want to read action comics when it was, we're talking the 90s, you know, you know, issue number 700 and something, you're not going to collect all those back. You're not going to go back in time and get all those. <laughs> it's just too much stuff. It's just not going to happen. And it becomes very encumbering for someone just trying to jump on who doesn't know, you know, like the running joke. Okay, you want to give, let me give you an Avengers book. What Avengers do you want to see? Do you want to see the modern standard comic Avengers? Do you want to see the movie Avengers? Do you want to see the, the cartoon version? And that's something that Marvel and DC have not focused on separating. I think if they had any kind of smarts, you'd have, and you'd have legitimately focused three different layers of comic book setup. You know, children, mid-teen, adults. And the adult stuff is HBO. It's definitely all the Vertigo, the adult line. That's what you're doing. And the fun stuff is the fun stuff, the four-color stuff. But the young kids stuff is the movies, the cartoon focus. Get them to get interested in the characters so you can get them on the next tier. But that can be a false lore. Where is it going to give you backstory and cover and story? Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, ben wrote, you know, but that can be a false lore. The writers aren't going to give you backstory incorporated into that story. Inhumanity definitely showed that. That's true. But I think if you control the writers better than Marvel and them have done, I mean, let's 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 just call let's call a spade a spade. Marvel basically just sells their IP to whatever writer wants to write on it to tell a story for as long as they want to tell it and to make money off of it. I am not going to see comic books that I saw when I was growing up as a kid anymore because it just is not something that people uh, do in the industry because they they know attention spans are short. Got to move the next thing. That being said, you can't also contradict what you've said the book before. That becomes a problem in the continuity of the character. And some people don't focus on that. Some people don't even think about that. Oh, continuity of character? Oh, I don't care. Uh, what was it? What was somebody who wrote something? Well, uh, one of the ones that just popped in my mind automatically was the <coughs> Kyle Rayner uh, Green Lantern ring. Uh, during uh, Final Crisis, there's a scene... Something else i got to write... Final Crisis is a scene where Kyle is fighting uh, Deathstroke, and Deathstroke is taken to JLA, and he's showing him why he's Deathstroke. Pretty impressive. It's a very Captain America moment, if you've ever wondered. And he grabs Kyle's ring, and just, ugh, Kyle, and he's fighting it over willpower. And apparently, you know, his willpower was, was, was stronger than Kyle. But if you'd read Green Lantern, you know that's not exactly how his ring totally works. So it kind of was one of those situations where the writer didn't know that, the fans did, it came out. Some fans are calling foul. Why didn't he know that? And, it, and you get those kind of situations. So, I personally hope to avoid those kind of situations, but it can be difficult. Uh, true that. They're just blunder forward with the editors trying to keep... Uh, also, I think... This is something Ben just said. I also think that most companies, what they should do... It's, it, it is very difficult to do this. I'm not going to lie. And I'm not going to make it sound like, oh, it's easy. I think they should have an online resource that writers, fans can look at to see the character stuff. So when they tell a new writer, look, go look at this stuff online, look what's happened before, it's been written in, da, da, da. you can read it, it's, you know, it's, it's like a wiki, you know, it's, it basically is a wiki, that you can follow the character and you can understand why this thing won't work by reading what, the, what, reading what we put down there, why it's canon, why this is canon, why this isn't canon, that kind of thing. I think those kind of things help stories. I mean, look at Star Wars. Look what happened just recently. This, this, uh, uh, this whole, this, okay, on the whole new animated uh, Clone Wars. Well, not Clone Wars. I keep thinking Clone Wars, but that's not it. Uh, Rebels. They added uh, Thrawn, who's apparently... And I don't... I didn't know who he was, so people told me. Um, they took a, they kicked a character that wasn't canon and now made him canon in the TV show. Which, and I assume the TV shows are canon. I was, I think the animated stuff is canon, so just accept it. And, and people were, like, freaking out how awesome that was. I didn't understand how awesome it was because I didn't, I didn't read that. I, re I was very much movie guy, cartoons... Maybe a comic book. Um, so that. You mean when you're playing the Punisher? <laughs> you know, Ben McFarlane is trying to have fun with me now while I'm trying to talk serious. I haven't forgotten that. No. But like say, I think... <laughs> that was very really funny. Maybe it's just maybe stop and laugh. I'm kind of giggling about it. It's just tough to run the business accordingly... But I think there's still opportunities as, you know, as publishers of 
IP producing things. Look, I make games, but I'm really making intellectual property. That's what my that's what I'm making. I'm making stuff that you can think about and play, but it's all IP. So how can I use my IP to do sell more things? And that's kind of what we're doing. See, it's nine. See, it's nearly nine fifty. This is supposed to be a thirty minute show, and every night it keeps going to become like a 45, 50 minute show. You all get me excited when I'm talking about stuff, and then I go back and reference stuff, and ugh. Just crazy stuff. Just crazy stuff. So, I'm going to stop right now. Um, as usual, you know, it's just there's tons of great stuff to talk about. I'm going to... Oh, I didn't show you this one. I, if I show you this one, I write it up now. Uh, the animated canon now. Fun is television extended. <laughs> yes, Ben. We definitely found the rabbit hole in this constantly, like you would not believe. All right, I'm going to show you this book. Because it's a cool book you should all pick up. Um, Stormwatch, uh, A Finer World, which is one of my favorite titles of any kind of book. Great name. Uh, this is one of the first, if this is the, I, yeah, this is the first piece that, uh, Warren Ellis did when he got on working for Wildstorm. It is a great book to read. A lot of cool stuff. A lot of cool ideas. Um, and this gets continued in authority. But let's, that's like the starting off point. Where you can see, if you've never read anything by, uh, Warren Ellis, you can see some great stuff in there. Uh, I'm going to say this again. I'm going to write this. Uh, Warren Ellis has a documentary. I can't remember what it's called now. And I have a copy of it. Uh, if you can check it out, it's got a lot. Of, it's very good for writers. If you're a writer or anyone creative, you'll find it very interesting. It's talking about him, but it, it's just a really great inspirational piece. Um, let me see if I can do this real quick. This is going to be the last thing I do, and then I'm getting out of here because I've got to go to bed and do work, I think. Uh, let me see. Transmet. I've never read Transmet. I've never read Transmet, so I can't give anyone an opinion on Transmet. Everyone tells me how great tra it's Transmetropolitan. A lot of people love it. I've never read it, so I don't know. People rave about it. I have not read it. I can't give you an opinion on it. I'd like to, but I'm, I haven't got it. Uh, Captured Ghost. Uh, if, you, if you can find it, it's it's a great... It's Warren Ellis Captured Ghost. I'm going to copy this right now because I'm lazy. Boom. Uh, but don't get me wrong. As much as I do like Warren Ellis... I think he does do a lot of things wrong. Like, he can't finish a story. I'm not going to say this, the one that is still upsetting me. Even though the series has ended, I'm still mad how horrible it was. That he, Oh, my God. That ending when we punch him in the face. Great starter, great middle. The ending needed some work. But, but you'll, as I said, anything you read, you'll be impressed. There you go. All right. I'm getting out of here because, you know, if I keep talking, we'll be here for an hour and a half. And tomorrow, of course, is Thursday. It'll be the end of the week. I don't know what we're going to talk about. I could talk about why my room looks like a mess, but I don't want to talk about that. That's a horrible mess I don't want to deal with. But, of course, we'll talk about some kind of business stuff. If you guys have any questions, uh, make sure either you put it in this thread right here, or if you're really nice. Oh, my battery's getting low. Better, better hurry up. You can check in the thread right here, or you can go to our YouTube page. Our YouTube page. Please go to our YouTube page. Please subscribe. It's very important. I don't ask you for money, but I ask you to subscribe because it's very important. This helps out me in the long run. Please go to YouTube, sign up a subscription. If you have a friend, sign them up. They're going to love it. It'll be good for them. The link is also will be in here. Will it be in here? No, the link will be in here. Just go to YouTube, type in uh, Lewis Porter Jr. or Transparency Agenda Daily. It should pop up. Boom. Subscribe. That's what I want you to do. That's the biggest commitment I want you to make for me is subscribe to us on YouTube. There you go. All right. I've got work to do. Um, probably even some stuff for Ben McFarland, but I haven't told him that I haven't got his maps done yet. So I know he's going to freak out when I say that. But I'm the boss. I can just leave it like that. All right, everybody. I'll see you all tomorrow. Have a good evening.